right, good evening. How is everybody doing tonight? It's good to see you all. As you know, I've gone the last few days, but I'm back. Glad to be back here with you guys tonight. Another wonderful, powerful message. Look at this one. I love the title of this one. How to postpone your own funeral. Who would like their own funeral postponed? Absolutely. We, we, we kind of like living, don't we? <laughs> All right. Well, I tell you what, Chad has some things for us. Again, he's going to give us straight from the Word of God the things that we need to understand, what God, a special gift of God's love for us tonight. So I look forward to the message tonight. And you know what we need to do before we go any further? We're going to pray, but also remember, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for me. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, again, we're so thankful for you. We're thankful for your love, your mercy, your patience, all that you've done for us, Lord, all that you do for us. And we ask you in a very special way that your Holy Spirit be with us tonight. Let us hear what you have for us tonight, how to postpone our own funeral, how to get to be everything that you want us to be, Lord. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for Chad. We thank you for the opportunity for him to share it. May your spirit speak through him in a powerful way that we hear what we need to hear in preparation to live forever with you. Thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, now it's time for our theme song. Uh, We got Sister Marcia. All right. Oh, okay, going to do it right there. Okay. Please sing with us tonight. Here's our theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. So now we are going to do our drawing a little bit different. Fadi is not going to give us a health topic tonight. So we're just going to go straight to the drawing here. And the first thing we have is a video from Anchor Point Films. And it is Revelations 7 Churches. It's a two DVD set about the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Be very, it's very interesting. You'll learn some new things about this, some things you probably didn't, didn't know at first reading in the Bible. And the other thing that comes with this is the Bible truth about hell, separating the facts from the fables. All right, what do we got, Fadia? We are 0274. Zero two, pull out those tickets. Zero, there we go, right there, okay. All right, and our next gift is another daily devotional. And this one is called Every Day a New Beginning. Learn from yesterday, live for today, and hope for tomorrow. Sounds pretty good, right? Daily devotional, every day a new beginning. And then also with it, we have a little magazine booklet it says the final events of bible prophecy what the bible really says about the rapture the millennium the second coming and more all right what do we got here Fadi? okay zero three zero six zero three zero six anybody got zero three zero six going once Going twice. I hate always picking a different one, but okay. I need another one, Fadia. All right. How about 0281? All right. There we go. There we go. We have a winner. All right, guys. Well, next up is our special music. Ah, it's Bob. Okay. 
And remember, guys, tomorrow night, don't miss tomorrow night. You've been coming all these nights, registering, put your name in the bucket. Tomorrow night, we're giving away this fantastic study Bible. You don't want to miss. You definitely won't want to miss because of the message. This is just icing on the cake. Amen? All right. Well, good evening. Hope you had a good day. Tonight, as we've already said, the subject is going to be how to postpone your own funeral. But before we begin, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, we need your presence. I pray that Jesus would be uplifted in all that we say and do. Thank you so much for Scripture. Thank you that you care for us. You care for our spiritual health and also our physical health. And as we study right now, I pray that your Spirit would fill us. In Jesus' name, amen. In Revelation chapter 13, tomorrow night we're going to begin to dive into specifically the mark of the beast, but this is the passage leading up to it where it says in in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and 17, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And we see that this is the second beast that rises up out of the earth is going to force a mark of the beast crisis. And so we need to have clear minds at the end of time. And we need spiritual hearts directed by God, by God himself. And God promises us, during this time, during this difficult time, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 16 says, He shall dwell on high, his place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks, bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. God says that when we're not able to buy or sell, when times get difficult, God is going to, our bread and water will be sure. You see, many people, before their bread and water is sure, they may be afraid, oh, if I can't buy or sell, I can't, I can't take care of my family. And some will take the mark of the beast in their right hand or in their forehead because 
They are afraid they won't be able to buy or sell. But God says, I'm going to take care of my people. Just like Elijah, when he was, he was running, he ran into the wilderness, and he was fed by angels. He was fed by, you know, talks, God miraculously fed him. He was fed, and he was taken care of during that time period. Raven, or yes, yes, Raven, sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. And so he was taken care of, just like Jesus at the end of the 40 days of fasting, we read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, what you end up seeing is that it says, in, when, when he made it through the third of the temptations, it says, and angels came and ministered unto him. Just like Elijah was saved in this difficult time, Jesus was saved when he was suffering from hunger, so too God will take care of his people in the last days. And Revelation chapter 12 verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. Remember, Satan's work is deception. Deception takes place in the mind. If deception takes place in the mind, we need to have clear minds. We need to have sharp minds at the end of time. And we saw the first angel's message, says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God, and notice these words, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. It says, fear God and give glory to Him. Now this idea of giving glory to God how does the Bible, the Bible actually tells us different ways that we can give glory to God. One way that we can give glory to God is by being faithful, believing, trusting in the Word of God. That's one way. But another way we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, where it says, Whether therefore ye eat or ye drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the what? Glory of God. So, one of the ways, or two ways right here, that we can give glory to God is whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, if you can eat and drink to the glory of God, do you think it's possible that you could eat and drink in a way that is not glorifying to God? Yes or no? Yes, there must be a way to do that also. And we're going to actually talk about this. And now, it's interesting because many people think, well, in the New Testament times, it doesn't matter what you eat or drink because... We're just, you know, that, that doesn't matter anymore, but 1 Corinthians 10 is the New Testament, right? This is in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, under grace, God still says there's a way to eat and drink that is to the glory of God, or the converse could be that it is not to the glory of God. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, this, this passage actually changed my life. It says, what know ye not? that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, as the King James says, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So what does it say? It says that your body, now, yes, this is not only our personal body, but God's body, the church, but it is also true that our bodies are to be the temple of God. That God wants to dwell within us. Just like God had a sanctuary in the Old Testament, God wants to dwell within us. And looking at this, that you are the temple of God, God's Spirit wants to dwell in you. And then it says something that some might find harsh, but I don't believe it is at all. It says in 1 Corinthians three sixteen and 17, Know ye not, don't you know, that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, this might sound to you like Old Testament speech, right? Like, oh, maybe that was in, like, Chronicles, or maybe that was in Deuteronomy, right? Maybe that was Old Testament speech. No! God says, you go and destroy your body, what's God going to do to you? He's going to destroy you. Now, you may think that sounds kind of harsh. That's New Testament. That's under grace. That if we choose to destroy our body, God says, I'm going to destroy you. Now, think about this for a moment. I used to be, I used to drink myself to sleep at night, as I've already said before. I used to be a smoker, and I couldn't quit. And actually, when I saw this passage for the first time, never seen it before, that was the first time I realized that God cared about my body. He didn't just care about my spiritual life. 
Some people teach God just cares about your spiritual life. He doesn't care about your body. But that's not what God says. He says, you go and destroy your body, I'll destroy you. And when I realized that, I was smoking, I was chewing tobacco at that point. I had a tin of of chew right in my pocket, right at the meetings when I heard this for the first time. And I realized God wanted me to quit. It wasn't just me that wanted to quit. Does that make sense? For the first time I realized, God was saying, Chad, you are destroying your body. If you keep doing this, well, I guess I'll just have to let you do what you want to do and I will destroy you also. And that was heavy. But you know what? To me, it wasn't scary. It was actually, wow! God wants me to quit, not just me. And that gave me hope because I had tried over and over and over and over and it was that very night that I gave up tobacco and never used it again at that point. Because there's power in the Word of God that God actually wants to give us victory over our addictions. And God gave me the victory at that point. So, there's things that we can do that give glory to God. What we do in our body can either give God the glory or it can detract from that glory. The Bible says, speaking of our Savior Jesus, it says in Luke 2.52, and Jesus increased in four different ways. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, that's interesting. Jesus increased in wisdom. Someone might say, well, but... Chad, I thought Jesus was God. Well, he was. He had been God from all eternity, but when he came to this earth, he became a human being. And because he became a baby, he didn't, he didn't like come out of the womb and like go for a run. He, had, he, he was a baby. He couldn't crawl even when he was born. He had to learn to crawl. He had to learn to walk. He increased in wisdom because he went through human experience just like we do. And so, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. That means he grew up just like a normal child would grow up. And he also increased in favor with God, so his spiritual life with the Father grew, and also his relationship with humanity. So, that's his spiritual life, his physical life, that is, his intellect also grew, and his social uh, experiences, all the aspects of humanity he grew in, and we can also learn from him. And the Bible actually tells us that there is a mind and a body connection, and that's why this is important in the last days. If we want to have clear minds, we need, we need to have clean bodies so that we won't be deceived in the last days because deception is the devil's work. And the Bible tells us there is this mind and body connection. This is incredible. Fadia mentioned this passage earlier in one of the health talks. A merry heart, Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a what? Like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. And we know this, that having negative thinking, depression, actually it is unbelievable. Men going through depression can like quadruple their chances of coming down with dementia. That's heavy. There is a mind and a body connection, meaning the thoughts they are thinking is impacting their brain. Same thing with women, although it's not, I think it's like twice as high, if I remember correctly, for women. But the point is, there is this mind and body connection. And there's some very interesting things we read back in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 20, 15, verse 26, where it says, and I'm going to show a, a video clip just in a minute, just in case our sound guy needs to prepare that. But in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, it says, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken, that means listen to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, God said, I will put none of these, these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So God says he is the one that heals us and because he can heal us and if we're faithful to him, he won't give us the same diseases that the Egyptians had. Well, for thousands of years, we didn't know what diseases those were. But I'm going to show you a video clip from a documentary that my wife and I made called Eight Secrets to Ancient Health and it's incredible what scientists are discovering. So... It's very interesting, in, in my specialty of diagnostic radiology, we've had the ability to go back 
3,500 years in time. The Egyptian mummies dating back uh, 3,500 years ago have been studied by autopsy, where they cut into the mummy and they look at the various organs and arteries, and also by CT scans. We can look at CT scans, we can look at MRIs. We can basically, uh, through these imaging devices, begin to understand the diseases of the ancient Egyptians. The paleopathologists are able to determine what types of diseases they had through x-rays and through different types of tests. Paleopathology is a study of diseases of ancient man. And they can look inside. And what they're discovering is actually fascinating. The upper echelon of the Egyptian society uh, suffered from the very same diseases that the upper echelon or middle class and upper class of of our Western culture deals with today. In fact, uh, Ramesses the Great is believed to have died from a heart attack. Heart disease, very common cause of death. Cancer, very common cause of death. Gallbladder disease was rampant uh, there with gallstones, with the increased cholesterol. Gallstones are always associated, or most often associated, with a very high fat diet. Again, consistent with the same kind of diet we have in Western nations. The famous Queen Hatshepsut, her mummy has been identified. And uh, Hatshepsut was probably the most powerful female ruler that ever lived. She actually ruled Egypt as king. She wore the royal headdress with the cobra. She even wore the beard that the uh, pharaohs wore. Hatshepsut is believed to have died from obesity, diabetes, and liver cancer. And the Egyptians did suffer uh, from diseases that we suffer from today simply because they also had a very similar lifestyle to what we have today. 70% of deaths in, in North America are due to chronic diseases that are diet and lifestyle induced. Globally, it's about 63% and rising. On the other hand, just imagine you could reverse many of these diseases by making some simple lifestyle changes. How we eat, how we drink, how we sleep, how we love. That means 70% of the patients can be treated effectively through lifestyle medicine. Many of these diseases, especially when it comes to heart disease, coronary artery disease, is totally avoidable. We know that if people chose to eat differently and if they chose to live active lives, the risk of these diseases would be reduced probably 90% for diabetes, 80% for heart disease, 70% for cancers, just by changing your diet and lifestyle. One of the food products and major parts of the diet of the ancient Egyptians was definitely meat products. That Egyptians thrived, if you will, maybe thrived is too strong a word, but they enjoyed, at least the wealthy did, their rich foods, their, their fowl, their meat sources. Any person of history knows who mummies were. They were the priests, the priestess, the kings, the queens. They're also called pharaohs. It was these affluent folks that began to develop the atherosclerosis and whatnot that we're seeing today. They were obese. Uh, they had, as I mentioned, artery disease all over the body. They had the diseases of rich people. Those that had diets of overabundance, maybe, you know, every breakfast, lunch, and dinner was kind of like Christmas, Thanksgiving, and New Year's in terms of the diet, and that was killing them, and it's killing us. However, it's quite interesting when you look at some of the earlier dynasties in ancient Egypt, and the paleopathologists studied the, the causes of death in those times, they actually ate more of a plant-based diet. They didn't refine their date sugar, they had more whole food plant foods, and they did not have the level of diseases that the latter dynasties had when they ate all types of animal products and unhealthy food. So as we look at the Egyptian mummies, we see diseases that are facing us today. And they're, they're discovering a tremendous amount of information, and we now know that if you choose that lifestyle, it doesn't matter if it was 4,000 years ago, you're going to have the same diseases. The lifestyle predicts the outcome. There's lessons that we can learn today when, when you look at the older culture which ate more of a healthy diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, unrefined foods, unrefined date sugar, whole plant foods. They had better health and you compared it to the later dynasties of ancient Egypt where they ate more of a diet actually, more like uh, Western diets today. They had all these types of diseases that we have today, the heart disease, the cancer, diabetes, etc. 
ancient Egyptian mummies, as we study them, are unlocking questions we've had for millennia about health, why people live, why people die. We know why they were dying, but they answer questions not just about the past, but also that we have in the present. What should we be eating now? And really, if we take that information, they're helping us uh, know what we should eat even in the future. It's quite interesting, isn't it? That what they have found is that these ancient Egyptians, we didn't know. God said, if you follow his commands, you won't receive all the diseases of the ancient Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. What were some of the diseases that they found? Dr. Rosalie David found that as they've investigated these mummies, that they had things like heart disease, cancer, arthritis, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure and rheumatism, and sexually transmitted diseases. Now, I don't know if... You, if, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds like kind of the normal diseases that people have in America, doesn't it? Yeah, but in actuality, most of these diseases can be either reversed or avoided by changing our lifestyle. So if we follow God's plan, we can avoid most of these diseases. And so we can learn to what? Whether therefore we eat or we drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. The closer we get, many people have just cast off these ideas about God's health principles in the Bible and said, ah, we don't need to do that. But strangely enough, those who have chosen to try to live by these are now the longest living people on planet Earth. Christians that try to actually follow even what God says about health end up having longevity far beyond many people living around them. Now, well, God says that following his teachings actually is for length of days. It actually, that's one of the reasons. Now, let's begin. Remember, this is New Testament. This is after the cross, this passage. But now let's go back. We're actually going to go back to the Old Testament for a moment, and we're going to ask the question about drinking to the glory of God. Can we drink to the glory of God? Notice what it says here. This is interesting. Many people don't know when the Bible talks about wine, there's two kinds of wine in the Bible. Isaiah 65, verse 8 says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the what? In the cluster. And one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. So God says, listen, he says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. What's a cluster? It's a bunch of grapes, right? And it says, what's found in the cluster of grapes? Something called new wine. So if you were to crush grapes, what comes out of the grapes? Yeah, we call it grape juice, but the Bible calls it new wine. They didn't have a word grape juice. They had the word new wine because what comes out of a grape is wine, and it distinguishes the different kinds of wine. New wine is what we call grape juice. Old wine is the fermented form. Obviously, that it can, be, if it's, it can be fermented, and then it's old wine. There's a distinction in the Bible. And the Bible war actually, you may, you may have seen the uh, bumper sticker, or some people wear a t-shirt that says something like, instant idiot, just add alcohol. Well, <laughs> you know, that can be very true, right? And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, it says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, that wine, do you think it's referring to old wine or new wine? Old wine, right? Because obviously, you're not deceived by grape juice. You don't drink some grape juice and then, you know, wow, my mind is gone, right? No. But that can happen with alcoholic wine. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Proverbs chapter 23. What does the wise man have to tell us? Proverbs chapter 23. And some insight. I bet some of you have felt this before. I certainly have. I'm not proud to say that, but it's true. Proverbs chapter 23, beginning in verse 29. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29. And the wise man says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has babbling? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? What do all these things come from sometimes? They that tarry long at the wine, they're drinking. They that go and seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red and when it gives the color in the cup and when it moves itself aright. Meaning it sounds like the bubbles are coming up. This seems to be that it's fermenting. 
And notice what he says about this kind of wine. He says, don't even look at it. Now, some of you might be thinking, does that mean I can drink the stuff with my eyes closed? Well, no, that's not what it's saying. It's like, don't even go near the stuff, right? And then what does it say? It says in, in verse 32, we're looking at Proverbs 23, verse 32, at the last, this alcohol bites like a serpent, and it stings like an adder. Then it says, in the King James, it says it this way, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. You'll say dumb things, and it says your eyes will behold strange women. There's even a term that people use in modern times. They call them beer goggles. You ever heard that term before? People just become interested in anybody at that point. They become more open. They become more promiscuous because they are deceived through wine. This is what the Bible says. It says, your, your, it says your heart utters perverse things. You're saying foolish things. Verse 34. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lies down in the midst of the sea, or he that lies upon the top of a mast. What is this talking about? I remember being so drunk, and I'm not proud of it. I remember lying down in bed, and it just felt like the world was moving. It felt like everything was just spinning around me. And somebody, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but I'll bet somebody else, um, hopefully I'm in the con, you know, all, all of y'all, you've just been saints your whole life, but I'll, I'll bet there's a couple rascals out there from the past. But nevertheless, it can feel like that, like you're in the midst of the sea, or on the top of a mast of a ship. The world is rocking. Then it says in verse 35, They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. Listen to this terrible statement. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Isn't that a terrible, terrible picture? Here's a person who's getting beaten when they're drunk. Here's a person who's just feeling sick and terrible as a result of it. They're saying foolish things, and they say, as soon as I wake up, I'm going to go seek alcohol again. This sounds exactly like the story of addiction, doesn't it? We don't care that it's destroying our lives, and I was there. But I'm so happy for the power of Jesus that he can give us victory. You don't have to be an alcoholic for the rest of your life. You can find the victory through Jesus Christ. It's interesting what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It tells us that God has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. So who becomes a king and a priest in the New Testament? It says the followers of Jesus Christ. So if you have given your life to Jesus, the Bible says that you become a king and a priest. Keep that in mind. Tuck that away in your mind. And he has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The, the Bible says that we are kings and priests before God. Okay, if that's the case, does God have any commands for kings and priests? He does. What does he say for kings and priests? We read in the Bible, it tells us in Proverbs 31, verse 4, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink what? Wine, nor for princes strong drink. Are we kings with God? Are we kings and priests? The answer is yes. God tells us, listen, if you're going to be a king and a priest, you better not drink wine, because that can disturb your thought process. This can hurt your mind. Now, we're actually told that around two out of five people who end up taking up alcohol end up having a serious problem sometime in their life with alcohol. And 80% of people in rehab relapse within the first year. So two out of five people, two out of every five people who take up alcohol at some point in their life end up having serious problems with an alcohol. Now, if I had a dog and I told you, he only bites two out of five people, you want to pet him? No, you'd be like, what? Two out of five people, those are not really good odds, right? And so too, it's, it's just something better to never take up in the very first place. And I looked back some years ago, over the course of a 20-year period, the road fatalities related to alcohol ranged from 39 to 60% of all fatalities on the road were from alcohol over a 20-year period. So roughly around 50%. It's actually, I think, dropped now, and I think because, in part, is there anything else that's taking people's mind off the road these days? 
Yeah, people are riding down the road like this, right? And so they're not even looking at the road at that point. They're texting and they're, they're getting in contact with friends or they're checking out Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or whatever, right? So there's other things now that have actually become even, you know, obviously the, these numbers have gone slightly down over time, but historically these were the numbers we saw. And somebody might be thinking, but what about the fact that Jesus changed water into wine? It's true. But remember, you need to look at the context to know what kind of wine because there's two kinds of wine. There's new wine, and there's old wine. And listen to what we read when we read the passage in John chapter 2 where it talks about this. It says, When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, he didn't know where it came from, but the servants, knew, the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then, at, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. And many people try to interpret that in light of how people drink today. They're like, oh yeah, you know, you, you start off with some of that really expensive drinks, and, then, and once you're drunk, you just go to the cheap, you know, natty light or whatever it is. Ah, who needs the good stuff once you're drunk, right? But is that what, is that what they're saying? That these people, are at, they're at a wedding, and they're all drunk, and Jesus is like, whoa, well, they've, they've had a lot to drink, but I'm going to... So it, it ends up telling us they had about six jugs with about 30 gallons apiece. That's about 180 gallons. Now, maybe there were, who knows, 150 to 200 people in that town at that time historically. And so if, if there are amount... So Jesus makes an extra gallon of alcohol for everybody there. Can you imagine how plastered they got after Jesus gave them that much alcohol? Can you imagine? Do you think Jesus was just getting the whole town drunk? No. And actually, in the Greek language, the word there for good, for the good wine, the word is kalos. And kalos can not only mean good in, the, in, a, in a literal sense, it also can mean good in a, in a morally benefiting sense or in a spiritual sense. Has anybody ever had a few beers and your spiritual life grew better and better as you drank. No. This is not what this is talking about. The context reveals what we are talking about. And the Bible actually warns us. Many people think, oh, you know, alcohol, these kind of things really don't matter. And was Jesus leading a whole village, two out of five people there, into a life of, of struggling with addiction? Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor drunkards shall inherit the kingdom of God. Was Jesus promoting alcoholic liquid? The answer is no. No, he was not. And he says that we are to be kings and priests, and if we are kings and priests, it is not for kings and priests to drink alcohol. This is very clear in the scriptures. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Matthew, Mark chapter 14, the second gospel. Here's another story that people think, oh, well, you know, at the Passover, they were passing around the alcohol during the Passover. What does the Bible actually say? Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. The Word of God reads, And as they did eat, Jesus took the bread at the Passover and blessed and break it and gave to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, does anybody remember what kind of bread they are supposed to eat during the Passover? What kind of bread was it? Unleavened bread. Because leaven, or fermentation, is a symbol of what in the Bible? Sin. And so during that time period, this was a symbol of having the house cleansed from anything fermented. And so they wouldn't have the normal, you know, fluffy, nice bread. They would have the unleavened bread. And by the way, doesn't unleavened bread taste fantastic? I love unleavened bread. I like regular bread too. I don't mean that. I, I certainly do. But on, on the Passover, they were to take all the leaven out of the house. Then what does it go on to say? We read on from there. It says in verse 23, And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. So what was in that drink represented the blood of Jesus. 
And it says, it says, verse 25, Verily or truly I say unto you, I will drink no more of the, what does he refer to it as? Fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it, what? New in the kingdom of God. So is this new wine or old wine that Jesus is referring to? New wine, very clear. He, he, two things, he number one calls it new, and number two, he calls it the fruit of the vine. And so what is in the fruit of the vine? We call it grape juice, they called it wine. But they called it new wine. And so in the context, when people think, and not only that, Truly, the Jews were not supposed to have alcoholic wine. Sure, over time, over the centuries, as they began to let go of the scriptures and follow traditions, they may have started diving into alcoholic wine, but that is not what they were to have. They were not to have during that time period. It was to be a solemn experience. Can you imagine what it was like when the Passover was taking place and that this putting the blood on the doorposts of the house, do you think inside they were getting, you know, having a few drinks and having a good old time while the well, the uh, angel of death was going over and they're drunk on the inside, but they're good people. They're drunk, but they're... No! It was to be the unfermented juice of the grape we, that we call grape juice, but they would call it the new wine. It's very clear that Jesus said this was the fruit of the vine. Well, that is one thing that can inebriate us. It can stupefy the mind and God is calling us to let go of anything that would stupefy the mind. Now he says, listen, the new wine, there's a blessing in it. There's a blessing in it. The new wine, the grape juice, right? And, yes, and also we think of the wine of Babylon. Very interesting, right? And we're going to come back to that in a little bit too. But there's something else that can destroy the body. Notice that... If we destroy our body, God says he will destroy us. And like I said, I used to be destroying my body. I used to smoke. I couldn't stop smoking. Now, I want to be very clear. Um, does God love smokers, yes or no? I mean, he loves the people, but he doesn't love the, the, you know, the sin of destroying your body, right? He loves, he loves the people, but he doesn't love us destroying the body. Just like God loves alcoholics, but he doesn't love the alcohol that's leading to that problem. And he wants to give them the victory over that. And we're told that each cigarette will take something like 14 and a half minutes off your life. And God says, if you destroy this temple, God will destroy you. Now, I want to show you a video clip from that same documentary. And we'll see some very interesting information. We come to the T, and the T stands for temperance. When we look at the definition of temperance, we talk about abstaining from things that are bad for us, but also moderation in things that are good for us. The word temperance is not something that we hear a lot in our society today, but we do hear the word addiction. One of the things that scientists have recently discovered is that there is a common pathway for addiction in the brain, and that pathway is the same whether it, it is for drug abuse, whether it's for alcohol, whether it's for eating disorders, or even self-mutilation behaviors like cutting, for example, also is lighting up that same addiction pathway in the brain. Alcohol is the second or third leading cause of death, depending on how you look at it. The Centers of Disease Control in Atlanta calls it the third leading cause of death in this country. It's amazing to me that some so-called scientists advocate that people drink alcohol to prevent heart disease when it's the third leading cause of death. Many people I see in my office often ask, aren't there health benefits to alcohol? There is absolutely no safe level of alcohol consumption when it comes to cancer. Types of cancers that have been correlated with alcohol use are cancers that you and I often have fears about. These are cancers such as breast cancer, oral cancer, and colon cancer. That's right. A woman who's a moderate drinker is putting herself at measurably increased risk of breast cancer. In June 2010, the American Institute for Cancer Research made the statement that there is no safe threshold for the use of alcohol when it comes to the occurrence of these cancers. Nobody should be resorting to alcohol for health benefits. Even if it may lower your risk of heart disease, it's increasing your risk of dying from any cause and increasing your risk of cancer. 
The National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism's official statement concerning alcohol and health has actually stated that the benefits that come from alcohol may not actually be from the alcohol itself, but other components of the foods that are made into alcohol, the plant-based foods. It causes high triglycerides, it causes hypertension, it increases the risk of bleeding strokes. Now someone says, but Dr. DeRose, I still like to have a glass of wine. Well, listen, that's up to you. You can make your own decisions, but don't label it as a health-giving behavior. The use of alcohol stimulates the same addiction circuit as any other drug. We are voluntarily, when we consume alcohol, we are voluntarily suppressing the frontal lobe of our brain. This darkened area is the judgment center and the center for tensions and anxieties. Even small amounts of alcohol tend to deaden these centers, and because of this may provide an illusion of relaxation. And so one of the worst things that we can do, especially if we're trying to optimize our brain function, is to drink alcohol even a little bit. So a practical illustration of the concept of temperance, at least in my book, as I read the medical research, is total avoidance from alcohol is the optimal. One of the really important things to understand about any addictive behavior is that it impairs our frontal lobe function. The area of anal analysis, of decision making, of our willpower. Which impairs our ability to make good sound decisions and to think clearly. And that, of course, impacts the rest of our lives. So any amount of addictive behavior is not healthy for the brain. And in reality, there are other things or even some foods, uh, other substances, of course drugs, that adversely affect the frontal lobe of the brain. One of the common addictions that Americans deal with is an addiction to caffeine. Some of my patients have lowered their cholesterol 20% just by cutting caffeine out of their life. The first week I stopped drinking caffeine, I felt terrible. I slept, I was moody, I was grouchy, I just, I didn't, I would come home in the middle of the day to take a nap because it was just, it was flushing out of my system. One of the big problems that uh, caffeine causes, especially in relation to mental health, is that it decreases the blood flow to the brain by about 27%. And that's not a good thing because in order to think clearly, in order to process correctly, we need the blood flowing to the brain which carries the oxygen and the nutrients so that our nerve cells can function properly. In fact, caffeine has been known to worsen psychiatric illnesses such as depression and anxiety. With my patients who struggle with insomnia, lack of sleep, I tell them to come off of caffeine. Initially, they're going to have a worsening in their sleep, but in the long run, we know that it will improve their REM sleep, an essential component of deep sleep. In addition, caffeine also causes what we call a withdrawal symptom and that can increase irritability, it can cause headaches, and it can it is an addiction so it makes you crave more caffeine to get that same stimulating effect. Once you get on the other side of about five days the energy level just shoots through the roof. Um, it helps that I stay hydrated but it's just I look at my body like a gas tank and whenever I drink caffeine it's taken a quarter of my gas tank and I really only have 75% left for the day. And I notice that difference when I don't drink caffeine. It's crazy, I have a full gas tank all day. We found from studies at the Life Cell Center of America that those who are trying to cut out habits that are detrimental to their health are going to find this difficult when they're consuming coffee. And so a lot of people, especially when they feel really fatigued in the afternoon, one of the big causes is because they are drinking caffeine, which uh, causes a letdown, and then they're also dehydrated from the effect of the caffeine as well. But there's more subtle forms. As you likely know, we've reported often here on World News about the powerful effects of coffee and the growing body of research telling us in the right amounts it can help us focus better and even fend off some disease later in life. But we ask tonight, what is it really doing to our brains? ABC's Lisa Stark with her own MRIs before and after. It's the most popular drug in the world. I need that little um, boost. It's everywhere, from 320 milligrams in a Starbucks Cafe Grande, about the max you should have in a day, to energy drinks, to sodas, now even inhalable, 100 milligrams in an instant. But could that daily dose of caffeine be changing your brain? We turned to researchers at Wake Forest in North Carolina, where I underwent two MRI brain scans. This first scan with no caffeine in my system. Then I downed just one drink. Now my second MRI. 
This was my brain before caffeine. This was after. The difference was remarkable. It's like a 40% drop in the blood flow to your brain. So that's a lot. So before caffeine, with caffeine, the blood flow to my brain dropped about 40%. 40%. Really? Yes. Why the drop? Caffeine blocks a chemical called adenosine, which controls blood flow to the brain. Add caffeine, blood vessels constrict, less blood circulates in the brain. And your blood pressure and heart rate go up. So if you skip your regular coffee, that surging blood can trigger a caffeine headache. It's like trying to get a fire hose to pump blood up through your skull. If you're a caffeine lover, your brain has actually changed. It now functions normally on caffeine. How much caffeine do I have to drink to change the physiology of my uh, brain? Not very much. Not very much? No. Like even a One cup of day? One cup a day will change your brain. The good news, experts say for healthy adults... Isn't that interesting? Dropping the blood flow by 40%. Anywhere from, uh, the studies show anywhere from about 27% is average. In this case, with the Starbucks, it was 40% drop in the blood flow to the brain. And as uh, Dr. Nita Hillman, in the video that we showed prior to that, she said that people who struggle with addictions to different substances find it more difficult to overcome if they are still drinking caffeine. I wasn't able to give up the tobacco until I let go of the caffeine. And so I would challenge you to let it go. It's not something we need. It's actually not good for us. But I want to talk now. I want to make a transition. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. What did God give for the food of humans in the very beginning? Genesis 1, 29, this is in perfection. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat or for food. And so God originally gave Adam and Eve a plant-based diet. And there came a time in Genesis, later on, at the flood, where God allowed humanity to eat meat. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 7. It's interesting. This is at the time of Noah. Was Noah a Jew or a Gentile? Anybody know? He was a Gentile, because no Jews, had, they came out of Abraham's loins over time, right? The uh, descendants of Abraham, but Abraham wasn't around at this point. And notice what it says, that when God first allowed man to eat meat, we're going to see in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast, thou shalt take to thee by what? Sevens. The male and his female, and the beasts that are not clean by what? Two, the male and his female. Many times some people, you know, they sing little songs with kids about Noah, and they talk about the animals went in two by two. But the Bible doesn't actually say that. They went in two by two and what? Seven by sevens. There's a difference. There's a distinction there. Now, when God first separated animals and allowed humanity to eat, there were clean animals and there were unclean animals. And so this was the distinction made before, before Judaism. So this idea of clean and unclean was for the Jews. No, 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 no. This is for the Gentiles. First, right? This is first for the Gentiles. Later on, the Jews ended up obviously also receiving the same message because this was for humanity because Noah was a part of humanity. There was no such thing else, right? And so as the truth, the true followers of God from the Gentiles who became the Jews also followed these same principles. They were to eat, if they were to eat meat, they were to eat the clean meat, they were to avoid the unclean meat. Well, what does the Bible say is the distinction? There's a number of distinctions. I want to look at what the Bible says. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 3 says, Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and choose the cut among the animals that you may eat. If an animal is clean, it has to have a split hoof, a cloven hoof, and it has to chew the cud. Well, many people, you know, if you didn't grow up on a farm, you probably don't even hardly know what a chewing the cud is. So I went and recorded some animals myself to show you what chewing the cud is all about, if you don't know. Here, right here, this is a pronghorned antelope. I was in South Dakota, and I got this video. Look at this guy. Watch him chew. Watch him chew. He's chewing. He swallowed. Did you see it go down? Now watch. Watch closely. Watch his neck. There it came back up. Did you see it come back up? He started chewing it again. 
That is chewing the cud. That is chewing the cud. And so what they do, I'll start it over so you can see it again, just in case you weren't, uh, you know, watching real close. Watch real close. You'll see, him, you'll see it go down. Watch it go down. Ready? Ready? There it goes. Went down. Now watch. Watch. Did you see it go back up? Did you see it? There it was. That's chewing the cud. Animals that chew the cud, they chew, 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 and it goes down in their stomach, and then it comes back up and they chew it some more, right? And the Bible says if an animal's clean, it has to both do that, it has to chew the cud, and secondarily, it also has to have, it's very simple, it has to have cloven hooves. These are buffalo. I recorded some buffalo hooves there. And so are those split hooves? Can you see the split in the hook? Yes. And so what are some of the animals? I should turn that down a minute. Uh, what are some of the, sorry about that. What are some of the animals that have split hooves and chew the cud? Well, buffalo is one. Yep. You have cattle, cows. They are also clean animals. And what's that? Deer. Can you think of any others? Sheep, goats, elk. Yes, yes, elk. So we have, you know, there's many different animals that are clean, that are mammals like that. But then, then you have uh, some animals that the Bible says are not clean. It says in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 6 and 7, remember, this, this was given to Noah, to the Gentiles, and then it was given to Moses to give it to, us, to, give it to the rest of humanity. And the hare, what's a hare? What's another name for hare? Rabbit. And the rabbit, because he chews the cud, but divides not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. So they have to both split the hoof and chew the cud. Do, uh, do, do rabbits have split hooves? They don't have hooves at all, right? If there's a paw, it's unclean, right? So it says, it says but it divides not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the swine, what's another word for swine? Pig, right? Though he divide the hoof, oh, he does that, and be cloven-footed, yet he chews not the cud, he is unclean. So they have to do both. And, well, let's look at this. We now know, because of science, a number of the reasons. Back then, they were just following by faith. We now know that these animals are less healthy to eat. The unclean animals. I'll give you an example. You look at, there's a certain parasite that is common in pigs. It's called the trichina larvae. And so this is something that as, as we eat these things, we're taking in these little worms. And as we eat these little worms, we swallow them, they go into our body, and then they begin to burrow through our body. They burrow through the flesh of the body, and they end up dying, and they'll sometimes leave like a calcified cyst in your joints and so forth. And so you'll, get, you'll start getting achy joints, and your doctor will say, oh, it looks like you have arthritis. Well, they didn't actually find out for sure it could be arthritis. It absolutely could be. But it also could be trichinosis. And so you're suffering from this calcified cyst on your bones, and you don't know. Actually, it's been called, tr tr trichinosis has been called like the great mimicker. It can mimic all kinds of diseases, and, and the doctors aren't like cutting into you to find out if there's these parasites in you. They often will not even know, and I'm not blaming them. I mean, who would know? Who would expect it? The Department of Agriculture years ago said 18% of all men carry trichinosis. And so this is the United States here. And the University of Southern California said that cooking pork is not enough to kill all of these worms. Okay, so you can't cook enough to kill them all. But I I've come to a conclusion. I don't want to eat a worm dead or alive, right? I don't want to cook it and eat it. I just don't want to eat it, right? I mean, who wants to eat a cooked worm? I don't want those things in me at all, right? And a friend of mine, I've seen them do I actually recorded a video of them. I'm not going to show you this because it's so nasty. Uh, but uh, I was in India, and I've seen this, that, you know, one of the things, this is terrible, and if you get grossed out too bad, just stick your fingers in your ear for about 30 seconds. So I was in India. I've seen this with my own eyes. What pigs will do is they will do their bathroom business. They'll do a number two, and others will come up right behind them and do what? They'll eat it up. These animals are the cleaners of the earth. They'll clean it up. And you know what the bit, you know what the, the grown one can help do? Or the one that actually let it out themselves? They'll often turn around and help them finish it. Do you see that the Bible says these animals are unclean? They're not healthy. That is disgusting, right? And then we take those toxins into our body. Well, Dr. McNaught 
found that one of every four pork specimens have uh, living trichina larvae in them. We know that pork now is the highest cholesterol source of all normal meats that people are eating. We look back through history. What about the Egyptians? They had all these diseases. Well, an autopsy of a young Egyptian named Noct revealed the presence of the trichinosis parasite. He had this, this trichina larvae in his body. Egyptologists now believe this was the result of eating pork. So God said, if, you, if you'll follow my commandments, you won't have the same diseases as those Egyptians. Now we know what they are, and we can avoid them by following God's simple principles that he gave to the Gentiles, that he gave to Noah, not to the Jews. The Jews got to benefit from the great things that he had given to the Gentiles. And then we see God says, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. And now somebody might be saying, but Chad, uh, it tastes so good. And I, you know what? I'm going to be very honest with you. When somebody first showed this to me out of the Bible, I said, that's crazy. Because you know what? You know what my favorite food in the world was? Pork ribs. Oh, barbecued pork ribs. And somebody shows this from the Bible. I'm like, ah, that's craziness. No way. That's all done away with. And we're going to look at the main text that everybody uses to get rid of that. We'll get to that in a moment. But nevertheless, I was like, no, that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. And so you know what I did? I went and ate me some pork. And you know what happened to me? I got sick. And I vomited it back up. But you know what? I'm a hard-headed person. When I vomited and got sick, you know what I said? This is just a coincidence. I went, and I went to another place and ate some more. It wasn't the same one. You might, I didn't go back like a dog to his vomit and eat from the same place. I didn't want that. No, I went, I went and found another place, right? And so I ate some more pork, and guess what happened the second time? I got sick again. <laughs> and then after the second time, I, now listen, I'm a hard-headed, I'm a bull-headed kind of guy. But, you know, after that, I was like, well, maybe God's trying to show me something. Before, in my ignorance, God was winking. He was winking at my ignorance, but once I, once I let go of the... It, I wasn't ignorant anymore. I saw what the Bible said, but I was just being rebellious at that point. But the Bible says, because you might be thinking, you know, it tastes so good. God wouldn't want to take something good away from me. The Bible says in Psalms 84, verse 11, no good thing will he, will God withhold from them that walk uprightly. God isn't keeping this from you because it's good. Well, you say, but it tastes good. Well, sure, it may taste good, but that doesn't mean it's good for you. God isn't keeping you from something good. He's actually trying to give you a better life. But there's other things in the ocean that aren't, other animals rather, that aren't healthy. Deuteronomy 14 verse 9 says, These shall ye eat of all that are in the waters. All that have two things, fins and scales. Can, what, what animals in the ocean have both fins and scales? They have to have both. Can you think of any? Or in water in general? Bass, they have fins and scales. What else? Uh, trout, you have yeah, uh, you have perch, you have, you know, even pike have it. Can you think of anyone that swims around the waters in this area that don't have scales? Catfish? <laughs> they have fins, but what don't they have? They have scales. And what are they also? They are, what, what do they eat? These are the bottom feeders. They're eating the, the, the filth. They are cleaning up the feces of everything. They're like the pigs of the water. They're water pigs, right? And so they're cleaning up the feces. God, you say, well, why did God make them if he didn't make them to eat? Well, God made them to clean up the earth. It's not like everything has to be eaten, right? There's all kinds of things that you don't eat, right? Like you don't eat every plant on planet earth. It may have a purpose. It may not be for you to eat at this point, right? And so this, I'm going to show you something very, so, uh, and we're going to get back to some of the things that are not good to eat, but this is fascinating. Listen to this right here. During World War II, American naval aviators shot down over the ocean, had no choice but to survive on whatever seafood they could catch. However, they often became very ill. Consequently, the United States government hired a marine biologist by the name of Bruce Halstead to research what kinds of fish downed pilots could eat safely. Halstead developed a, a thick manual showing pictures of fish that were safe to eat and those that were not safe to eat. He also said, now here's the thing, if, if you had this big manual and you looked at it, you're like, oh, interesting, that one's good, but imagine you're shot down over the ocean. You're going you're gonna to remember a big fat manual with thousands of different fish. I mean, you might if you got like a photographic memory, but me, I'd, I'd get in the ocean, grab hold of something, be like, 
Was this a good one or a bad one? I can't remember, right? And so what did he say? Listen, to this is amazing. He also said, if you lose the manual, remember one thing. If it has fins and scales, you can eat it. If it doesn't have fins and scales, such as crab, lobster, shrimp, oysters, clams, don't eat it because they have a high level of what? Toxicity. Did God knew these animals had a lot of toxins in them, yes or no? Now, why do they have higher levels of toxins? It makes perfect sense. You can find these things often in very filthy water, and they have a job that God gave them. And that job is to do what? Clean up the water. Give you another, if, once again, if you get grossed out, plug your ears for a moment. Uh, true story, Fadia had a teacher. He lived on the East Coast where, you know, uh, people love getting their shrimp and lobster and all those kinds of things. And I used to eat those things too growing up. And, and he, uh, what he would do is they, he was right there up near the ocean and there were, there were these restaurants that people would love to come and eat. And out at the end of the docks, we don't do this anymore. You know that the world is a different place today than it was 45, 50 years ago. Well, they used to have, they would literally at the end of a dock, out over the water, they would have an outhouse with a hole that dropped down into the ocean. So you didn't have to dig a hole, it just washes away in the, in, in the water, right? And so people would go out there, and what he would do is he would, people would go out there and they would do their number twos. And as they would sometimes float in the water, the shrimp would come up and start eating it. And he would be right there with his net, and he would scoop up those shrimp. And you know what he would do with the shrimp? He would bring them over and sell them to the restaurants. <laughs> and so what do you, and, and I, listen, I used to eat those things all the time. And my dad, he, even as a kid, I, I would eat them. I would eat them, and then, and then he, he still tells the story when I go home. He said, Chad, you used to love shrimp until you found the mud vein. Do you know what the mud vein is? You remember that dark thing that runs through the center of the shrimp? That you often eat. I ate it back then. You know what the mud vein is? It's their intestines with what in it? Yeah, what, exactly. What intestines have in them? And we eat that. That's the thing about shrimp. You don't even have to add anything to it to give flavor. The flavor just comes right out from the center, right? And that's what we eat. And God is saying, these things are unclean. They're not healthy for you. And even, what do we see? As research from the United States government says, God was what? He was right. Isn't that amazing? Deuteronomy 14, verse 10 says, And whatsoever has not fins and scales, ye may not eat of it. It is unclean unto you. So, obviously, things like the turtles or the crabs, they're, they don't have fins and scales. The shrimp, obviously, you get the idea. But what about some other animals? So it's pretty simple. If it has fins and it has scales, it's clean. If it doesn't, it does, it, it, it's very simple. God didn't make it so complex that we couldn't tell. Deuteronomy 14, verse 11 says, Of all clean birds you shall eat. And then it goes on to tell us what animals are not clean, what kind of birds. And it's basically like owls and buzzards and hawks and mainly birds of prey. And that kind of makes sense. And I could, I could tell you filthy stories about those two, but we don't have time for that. If you want to hear some stories afterward, I'd love to tell you. We'll go hang on the back and tell you some more. But nevertheless, I want to show you a video clip that is kind of interesting. Dave, investigations Oops. have been... Sorry. That's same. As we look at the world today, invest... Whoops, I'm messing this up. As we look at the world today, investigations have been done into current society and looking for places where people live the longest and the healthiest. Something that caught my attention is something called the Blue Zones. It's a book written by Dan Buettner from National Geographic magazine. Blue Zones are places in the world where people not only live long lives, but they're actually healthy at these advanced ages. Where you have people that are in the zone, the Blue Zone, they're living a long time. So Sardinia, the Okinawans, the Costa Ricans, or in America, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist. He found five zones in the world, and one of them is Loma Linda, California, which is a high concentration of Seventh-day Adventists. One of the group of people that's been studied the most in modern science in this world are Seventh-day Adventists. 
scientists have wondered why is it that these uh, individuals have lived so much longer. Seventh-day Adventists actually live significantly longer than any other group of people on the face of the earth. They're the only blue zone that is increasing in longevity. So they've started doing studies to look at that and there's been a number of studies for instance done on Seventh-day Adventists here in America sponsored by the US government and other groups to unlock that question. The Adventist mortality study showed that Adventists had death rates from all cancers that was 60% lower for Adventist men and 76% lower for Adventist women. Lung cancer, 21% lower. Colorectal cancer, 62% lower. Breast cancer, 85% lower. The basis for this longevity, this quality of life, is the lifestyle changes. They have less heart disease, less cancer. From the time I was 75 until I was 95, I assisted cardiac surgeons in the Los Angeles area. And I quit assisting in cardiac surgery because I wanted to quit while I was still able to make that decision. In other words, my problems of my advanced years would not make me quit. But the fact is, I could do cardiac surgery today. They actually uh, have a higher quality of life, and if they follow the health principles that they know of, they will live on average 15 years longer than people living next door to them. So the Adventist mortality study really woke people up. They said, wow, that is significant, 60, 70 percent lower. We need to look even closer. Well, they're the most likely to reach the age of 100 and reach it with a health of mind that's still there uh, and still be able to, um, uh, to do a lot of things. And we're finding that when people embrace this, regardless of ethnicity, genetic background, we're finding that, that we're finding longevity, more years and more life in the years. When we look at this population of Adventists, we note that they have eight lifestyle choices. These eight lifestyle principles have been summed up in an acronym known as New Start. It's interesting that God says, if you keep my commandments, even referring to God's health principles, he said, you will have length of days. And many people say, oh, that stuff doesn't matter, but God wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be happy. It also promotes happiness. The ones who follow it the closest are actually, the, they're happier. And I'm gonna, I'll show you some stuff on that in another session as we go forward, even as we look at the mark of the, or, uh, no, not the mark of the beast. We'll look at that even Saturday morning. But someone might be saying, Chad, you're forgetting that Peter told us, Peter had a vision, and God told him that you can eat unclean meat. Chad, you're forgetting that. Oh, I'm not forgetting. Let's read that passage and allow the Bible to interpret itself. Not the traditions of men. Let's go back to the passage and read it ourselves. Acts chapter 10. If you have this, you need to see this in your own Bible. Don't trust me. Don't trust your pastor. Don't trust anybody. Trust the word of God. Acts chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, you need to see this. If you don't see it, it won't be as... You've got to see what it says, not what I say. Acts chapter 10 Look with me beginning in verse 9. Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 9. It says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey, and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up out of the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry. And he would have eaten, but while, he was, while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed what? Animals, or the King James says beasts, beasts, and creeping things and fowls of the air, or birds. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common, or what? Unclean. Now keep in mind, this is years after Jesus died. And Peter says what? I've never eaten anything unclean. So it's not like when Jesus died, they were like stabbing pigs and trying to see how they taste it. They didn't think that was what Jesus was talking about. But you might be saying, but Chad, right there it says, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. 
And there were, what was in, now keep in mind this was a prophetic vision. A prophetic vision of a sheet. What was in that sheet? All manner of what? Beasts. Beasts. Keep in mind, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? Nations. All manner of beasts. Now, don't take my word for it. He actually, God tells him what this means. It has nothing to do with food. It, he actually tells us. You've got to read it for yourself. Don't trust me. Read the Bible. It goes on to say, it says in verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God has cleansed thou shalt not call common. This was done thrice or three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven, while Peter, notice what it said, did, he, did Peter run off and find a pig to eat? No, it says, now while Peter doubted in himself what the vision which he had seen should mean. So he didn't know what this meant. He didn't, he didn't at the end of the vision, go, oh, God's telling me to eat unclean food. He's like, what on earth did that mean? What did that mean? I just had a vision about all these beasts in a sheet, and I don't know what it means. The good thing is God tells them in just a minute what it means. And it says, it says in verse 17, Now while Peter doubted in himself what the vision he had seen should mean, behold, uh, the men which were sent from Cornelius. By the way, Cornelius was a Gentile. He was an Italian. So Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision. So Peter's still thinking like, man, what did that mean? The Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek for thee. Arise therefore and get down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. So Peter has this vision about all manner of beasts. And then some Gentiles, some Italians show up right away, and he's sitting there like, man, what does this mean? I don't know what this means. And when they show up, he, the Spirit of God says, go with these people, don't doubt anything. Now, we still don't know what it means, because God hasn't told us. But jump down with me, so they come to him, and, and these are Gentiles seeking the gospel, and it says in verse 25, jump down to verse 25, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now, would Jewish people worship another human being? Yes or no? No. This is a Gentile. This is a, an Italian. He bows down and worships him, verse 26. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, you know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should call no pig common or unclean. Is that what the text said? No, it doesn't say no pig. He says God has showed me that I should call no what common or unclean. Man, the text has nothing to do with food. It has to do with beasts that represent nations. And God says, go ahead. These people are not unclean. You don't have to be separated from the Gentiles. Notice, nowhere in the text does God say, Peter, go, go over there. He says, listen, I don't know what this is about. And he says, God told me what it was about. This passage is not about eating meat. This passage is about not being afraid to go into the Gentiles. These nations, these beasts, meaning nations are represented by beasts, they are not unclean. That all of humanity has an opportunity to receive the gospel. So very clear. Read it again, just in case you missed it. Verse 28. And he said unto them, You know how that is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation, but God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. This is a vision that helped the Jews realize that the Gentiles were not unclean and that they could go into them, they could eat with them, they could fellowship with them, and they could share the gospel with the Gentiles. It's sad that Christianity has taken this passage 
that is interpreted by God to be an opening to the Gentiles, and they, they've gotten rid of the actual interpretation and just go back to the vision. Imagine going back to Daniel, the vision of the four beasts, and saying, oh, there is a beast with you know, a four-headed leopard and four, uh, with four wings. Oh, it's about a four-headed leopard. with No, those are symbols for something, right? What is the purpose of the vision? And we read in Revelation chapter, 18, even in Revelation, what does it say? It says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fall Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful what? Bird. Notice even the book of Revelation talks about unclean birds, right? We see this. So I want to talk about, and this was written 60 years after Jesus' death, still talking about unclean animals. Well, what can I do? What can I do? What if you struggle, maybe with an addiction like I did? Maybe you struggled with smoking or drinking or drugs or whatever it is. What can we do? Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10.31 that there has no temptation. God has given us promises to overcome. There had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you or will not allow you to be attempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Every time you're struggling with the cigarette, with the alcohol, with the drugs, or things you know that are not healthy for you, you can say, Father, you promise me that there's no temptation that has come to me that is so powerful, but that I can overcome through your power and trusting, Father, that you're going to give me the victory. We know that Jesus said this. He said, without me, you can do what? Nothing. And Philippians 4.13, you know the text. I can do all things through who? Christ which strengthens me. I want to close with a story. God can give you the victory. There's there, there an old preacher by the name of Joe Cruz. I know his grandson, who's also named Joe Cruz. But nevertheless, Joe Cruz, the old minister, he tells a story of how, do you, some of you remember that back in the day, you used to be able to fly on planes and smoke cigarettes on the planes. Can you imagine today? Like being stuck in a tube with a bunch of people smoking. I mean, you can't even imagine, but that was the way it was. And so Joe Cruz was sitting down, and there was a, a young man sitting next to him, and the young man was just staring up at the no smoking sign. And as the plane taxied down the tarmac there and ended up ascending into the clouds, at some point, you know, they turn off the no smoking sign back in the day. And when they turned it off, that young man immediately reached down into his briefcase and he pulled out a pack of cigarettes and he took one, he lit it up and started smoking. And Joe turned to him and he said, hey, have you ever thought of quitting? And uh, the man said, well, yeah, man, I, I would love to quit, but I can't. I've tried over and over, I just can't quit. And Joe said, actually, I, I put on, one of the things I do is I put on seminars teaching people how to overcome smoking. Would you mind if I would give you some tips? And the guy said, certainly, please do. And so then Joe reached down into his bag, and he pulled out a secret weapon. He pulled out one of these. And the man saw it, and he said, oh, no, I I've tried that, and it didn't work. And Joe said, oh, is that right? Well, he found out the man was a Baptist, so he did believe in the Bible. And as they got talking back and forth, he said, can I share a passage with you? And he went to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57 and 58, where it says, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But he begins by saying, thanks be to God, which gives us the victory. And so he asked the man who was smoking, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, the last time you tried to quit, did you believe that God gave you the victory? And you know what the young man said? He said, well, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't believe that. And he said, when we seek to overcome any temptation, we have to believe that God is the one there giving us the victory. And when we claim that promise and trust in him, we can do what? We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. Not I can do all things on my own because I'm tough and have a lot of determination. No, I can do all things. I couldn't overcome cigarettes. I tried over and over and over and over. I proved that. 
But when I saw the promises of the Word of God that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, I realized God said, not only is your body the whole temple of the Holy Spirit and I want to dwell in you, but he also said, Chad, if you destroy that body, I'm going to have to destroy you. And when I saw that, it was that night, it was that night I took that tobacco out of my pocket, that tin of chew, and I threw it out that night, and God gave me the victory. Friends, he can give you the victory. You can trust in his promises. God is saying, I want to give you victory over things that may have been holding you down. Let us bow our heads as we pray. And while every head is bowed and every, every eye is closed, is there anyone here that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart? Maybe you have something in your life that has been, you've been struggling to give up, or maybe you didn't even know you needed to give up, and right now the Holy Spirit is saying, you know what, you need to let go of this. Maybe there's someone here, it may not be smoking, it may not be drinking, maybe it is. But while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, is there one person who the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and while you're While every head is bowed and every eye closed, you just want to raise your hand. And in the silence of your heart, you're saying, Jesus, I need your help to overcome. Raise your hand where you are just now. God sees your hands. Is there anyone else who feels that burden in your heart? Raise your hand where you are just now. There's something that God is calling you to let go of. The Spirit is speaking to you tonight. And you want to just simply raise your hand and say, Jesus, I need your help. Raise your hand where you are just now. God sees all the hands. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, well, not that we are filled with strength, but we're thankful that you have all power. And you promise us in your word, in Colossians 1 verse 11, we can be strengthened with all might unto your glorious power. Father, thank you that you have all might, and we can can acquire that power because you can give it to us. Lord, I pray that you would give us victory over any bad habit, any sin that is so easily beset us, and let us walk with endurance the path of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love. In the name of Jesus, amen. Just want to let you know, there's, uh, we have a handout on the way out, and also tonight and Saturday night, which will be after Sabbath, that will be... These will be the last two times. Tomorrow night we won't have the DVDs out, so if you have any interest in the cookbook, tonight or after Sabbath Saturday night, those will be the only two options left to get the DVD. So if you have any interest, my wife will be back there. And tomorrow night is going to be the Mark of the Beast. You don't want to miss the Mark of the Beast. And then Saturday is going to be in the morning at 11. You don't want to miss the Remnant. And we'll be back for our final message at 5 o'clock, not 7, 5 o'clock, for the unpardonable sin. You don't want to miss that. God bless and have a wonderful night.